Hi there, I'm the MythKeeper. Welcome back to my channel, the best place on the internet for Pathfinder lore and history. If you like this kind of content, be sure to like and subscribe. And if there's anything you'd like me to talk about in particular, let me know in the comments below. I read all the comments. So this week we're going back to my creature feature series. Uh, it's been a while since I've done a, a video like this one. Uh, I'm calling it uh, the Mythic Beasts Creature Feature. Uh, and instead of doing uh, one creature type, I'm tackling a collection of creature types that I think uh, all stem from mythology and are all sort of beastly in nature. Uh, so I think this will be a fun video. I'm going to go a little bit deep on each of them uh, and give you a, a, a good collection. Enjoy. In the world of Pathfinder, even clear skies may pose a hidden threat. We've already discussed the dragons in my creature feature series, enormous and incredibly intelligent creatures capable of flying above the cloud cover and striking unexpectedly at any location. But although they are the apex predators of the sky, they are certainly not the only large predatory creatures out there. We've also discussed the mighty rocks in my megafauna video. But between the large winged animals like the rock and the magical and intelligent dragons, there are a whole range of magical beasts of varying degrees of intelligence and threat level that principally stem from mythology that populate the wilds of Pathfinder. In this particular video, I'm looking specifically at larger mythological creatures, typically winged creatures, many of which the advanced societies of Pathfinder have started to tame to allow them some mastery over the skies as well. The creatures I'm covering in this video include the Chimera, the Griffin, the Hippogriff, the Manticore, the Pegasus, the Phoenix, the Lamassu, and the Sphinx. As per usual with these videos, I'll give a little description of the creatures' real-world origins before diving into their specific mythology in the Pathfinder world. The Chimera. In Greek mythology, the Chimera was a unique fire-breathing beast that terrorized the kingdom of Lycia in Asia Minor. Described by Hesiod and Homer as a tripartite creature, melded from goat, lion, and serpent, she was one of the many Greek monsters spawned by Echidna and Typhon. Depending on the specific source, legends state she was either the sister or the mother of the Sphinx and the Nemean lion. In Pathfinder, the Chimera is a malevolent creature, with a cryptic origin and a monstrous form. Its visage combines that of a mighty lion, whose head is flanked on one side by the scaly head of a chromatic dragon, and on the other side by the head of a goat. It also sports a pair of leathery wings and a scaly dragon's tail. Tales surrounding the origins of the Chimera continue to evolve as they are recounted, but typically involve some kind of sorceress or arcane origin, with others claiming that they are the result of meddling by the goddess Lamashtu. The creature's peculiar amalgamation allows for the plausibility of various narratives. These stories, though potentially inaccurate in their specifics, are not wholly divorced from the Chimera's reality. Its name has become synonymous with an unsolved conundrum. Indeed, it would seem as if nothing in the world could possibly embody all the attributes ascribed to the Chimera were it not for their irrefutable existence. Among the myriad things that make these creatures unique, Chimeras are also hermaphroditic creatures, possessing both genders, with mating resulting in both partners becoming pregnant. The evolution of their social structure, however, has led to some level of sexual dimorphism. In this system, the primary members of each pack adopt a female role as the pack leader, while the other pack members assume male roles. In the event of the death of the female pack leader, often due to a challenge from a male, the surviving challenger, typically the most powerful male in the pack, has the biological capability to change from male to female. The reverse transformation also occurs when a deposed female chimera survives the loss of her position or when a female chimera, either individually or as part of a mated pair, joins an existing pride. Although biologically complex, they are not so complex psychologically. Despite having three heads, a chimera possesses only a singular consciousness that unites them. These creatures are no more resilient to mind-affecting influences than other beings, and their heads communicate with a united mind and voice, with no internal disagreements. While the breath weapon's damage from a chimera is contingent on the color of its dragon's head, it can expel this lethal discharge from any of its three mouths. Chimeras have the potential to live up to 200 years, although most meet their demise either at the claws of their own kind or at the hands of mightier adversaries long before reaching that age. While chimeras are capable of speech, their intelligence is limited, and they can do little more than utter curses, engage in bluster, issue threats, or when tamed by a more powerful entity, express complaints. These creatures display enough cunning to set rudimentary traps and stage ambushes, but their tactics remain rudimentary at best. They possess the ability to fly, but clumsily and without grace. In combat they prove quite dangerous when they hold the upper hand, yet if wounded they tend to withdraw in search of easier prey. Their nature is better characterized as indolent and not cowardly, however. They are content to scavenge rather than actively hunt, but when hunger strikes, 
Chimeras remain constantly on the hunt, attacking any creature smaller than themselves. Despite their coarse qualities, chimeras exhibit a remarkable adaptability that allows them to thrive amidst desolation. Their intelligence, while savage, is just sufficient to remember assailants and seek vengeance, clever enough to avoid falling for the same trick multiple times, and social enough to gather in prides when overwhelming an enemy proves the optimal strategy for victory. Chimeras are straightforward creatures and typically find satisfaction in establishing a lair within a cave or a similar environment. They have a preference for layers that align with their abilities, avoiding locations with narrow bottlenecks that might impede their movement. Instead, they seek spaces with ample room for flight, particularly favoring caves situated atop or within cliff faces, as well as nests nestled among rocky spires. To deter potential intruders, they often create rockfalls or require nets and similar tools to obstruct the path of climbers heading towards their lairs. Additionally, they are smart enough to employ their breath weapon to obliterate ropes and other climbing equipment, making the approach to the Chimera's lair as perilous as the ensuing confrontation for adventurers. Chimeras inhabit various regions within southern Avistan and Kazmarin, as well as throughout much of Garand. Their origins have been traced back to the Isles of Iblidos, where the eldest Chimeras dwell. Over time, these creatures expanded their territories far beyond their ancestral home, venturing into the World's Edge Mountains and beyond, where they established lairs and ancient ruins on both sides of the Inner Sea. These beasts subsequently proliferated along the northern shores of the Inner Sea, spanning the regions that are now known as Taldor, Anduran, Cheliax, northward to Galt and the River Kingdoms, and westward to the Arcadian Ocean. They pose a menace to local villages and their livestock, prompting efforts to hunt them down in some areas. However, in other regions, locals made accommodations for the Chimeras. Many ancient Talden nobles adopted the Chimera as a symbol in their heraldry, and some even acquired these creatures as status symbols. Centuries later, these noble families, now a part of the Chelish Empire, introduced Chimeras to Sargava during their conquest of the region, where they used them as magically bound war machines. The Chimeras adapted swiftly to the climate and environment. Some eventually broke free, fleeing into the wild, and their descendants now rule over territories in the Bandu Hills, the southern savannas of the Maneri Plains, and beyond. In these areas, Chimeras are known to gather prides of both ordinary and dire lions under their dominion. These Sargavan Chimeras subsequently migrated throughout the Mwangi Expanse. The Griffin Griffins have a rich mythological history, with origins in both Greek and Middle Eastern mythology. This mythical creature was often considered the ultimate ruler of all beasts due to its combination of the lion, the king of the animals, and the eagle, the king of the birds. In various cultures, griffins were viewed as potent protectors of treasures and valuable possessions. Ancient Persians believed these noble creatures safeguarded against evil, witchcraft, and secret slander. Others regarded griffins as symbols of divine power. Despite differences in interpretations, most cultures associated griffins with qualities like strength, wisdom, and power, making them a popular choice for coats of arms and heraldic designs, a tradition that continued in European heraldry right through the Renaissance period. In Pathfinder, like the Chimera, the griffin is a magical winged beast, with an intelligence level that sits somewhere between human and animal. Humans tend to characterize these creatures as proud and noble beasts, and they are among the most frequently trained mythic beasts to serve as mounts for cavaliers and champions. In reality, though griffins are quite intelligent beasts, they are less concerned with vague concepts like honor and more aligned with their animalistic instincts. Their fondness for horse meat and territorial tendencies often lead to conflict with civilized races, although griffins usually prefer to keep to themselves. Unless bred in domesticated environments, griffins are not easily trained. New riders are often surprised by how griffins respond reluctantly to both spoken and unspoken commands. This reveals that griffins are not mere beasts, but highly intelligent predators, wary of humanoid interference with their natural way of life. Although intelligent griffins lack the appropriate vocal cords and voice boxes to allow for actual speech, still those raised in the vicinity of humanoids quickly pick up the local language. They understand complex arguments and discussions, though they can only communicate their own points of view using gestures, grunts, and screeches. Their intelligence shines through during battles as they execute sophisticated maneuvers and employ basic tactics to gain the upper hand against their foes. Griffins mature and age quickly relative to humanoids. While some griffins have been known to live up to 50 years, most individuals in the wild rarely live past 20. Young griffins reach maturity after four to five years. At this point, male griffins leave their homelands in search of mates. A male griffin may travel several hundred miles before encountering a potential female partner. When he does find one, he is resolute in his determination to win her favor. Courtship rituals for griffins vary by region, but most take a year or more to complete, 
with some courtships lasting as long as five years. During this time, the male familiarizes himself with the land, constructs a suitable nest, and locates herds of animals to prey upon. The male presents gifts of raw meats and rare fruits to his prospective mate. Offering horse meat is seen as a remarkable display of skill and admiration. A griffin suitor who slays a particularly large or powerful steed and presents it to his potential mate frequently gains her favor more quickly. Such displays of metal are often used to settle disputes between rival suitors. When a female griffin accepts a male's courtship, they engage in an elaborate mating ritual, performing various aerial maneuvers, including cartwheels, swoops, and somersaulting descents. At some point, they lock talons and plunge towards the earth at high speeds, releasing each other just before impact. If the male fails any of these complex maneuvers during the dance, she will reject her suitor. However, if the dance succeeds, the griffins are considered united. Griffins are known to mate for life, and if one of a mated pair dies, the surviving griffin lives out its days alone. Separated mated griffins ardently search for one another, often foregoing food and safety in their quest to reunite. Female griffins tend to be larger and heavier than males, which aids in keeping their eggs warm during incubation, especially in hilly regions where griffins reside. A pair of griffins typically produces one to four eggs per year. During the incubation period, the female watches over the nest, while the male hunts for food, often sharing his prey with his mate to help her stay warm. Hatchlings emerge from the eggs after incubation, resembling small dogs in size. Raising these young griffins demands substantial amounts of food and attention for their development. As the mother nurtures her offspring, she becomes even more aggressive towards potential intruders, and the father hunts larger and more dangerous prey to feed his family. Young griffin typically learn to fly six to nine months after hatching, becoming capable of taking care of themselves and often guarding their younger siblings from threats. In addition to the traditional varietal, a wingless type of griffin called the alki griffin also exists. These are born when griffin eggs are brooded by their father rather than their mother, while flightless alkies are known to be swifter runners than winged griffins. Griffins can be found throughout the entire inner sea region, but they are more common in hilly areas that divide nations. These regions include the Storval Plateau in Varicia, the Shattered Range in the eastern Wangi Expanse, and the Aspidel Mountains in Andoran and Cheliacs. Griffins in southern Avistan typically have brown fur and tawny white feathers, but in other parts of the world they exhibit a wider variety of colorations. In the desert regions of northern Garand, they often have black fur and plumage. Within the depths of the Mwangi jungle, there are reports of striped griffins with black and gold markings, as well as larger breeds with black and white markings. Some griffins of renown are as follows. In the Five Kings Mountains, Caradun is a red-eyed griffin with black fur and wicked ebon wings. Its head and the front half of its body resemble that of a great raven, while its other half resembles that of a lean panther. The beast stalks the northern highlands of the Five Kings Mountains, preying on caravans traveling to and from the dwarven city of Tar Kesmuk. Most dwarves recognize Caradun as a minion of the infamous nascent demon lord Tree Razor, which escaped from his master's prison in the Tanglebriar to the north. The beast has developed a keen taste for dwarven flesh, causing the stout inhabitants, even many of the Blue Wardens, to fear straying too far from Tarkazmuk's walls. In Osirian, Pashnia of the Shining Mountains is a famous female griffin with feathers the color of beaten gold. She can often be seen basking in the sun on promontories overlooking the Asp and the River Sphinx. Many locals consider her a kind and patient guardian of the hills where she resides. Skeptics believe she may be waiting for a mate. Nonetheless, Pashnia is known to attack intruders who venture too deeply into the Shining Mountains in search of gold or other riches, though offerings of horsemeat can temporarily distract her. The nature of the treasure she guards remains a mystery, but adventurers speculate that it must hold some significant value to her. Near the settlement of Dakarium on the outskirts of the Barrowwood in Cheliax, a druid rider and his griffin mount patrol the land in search of devil worshippers who seek to make sacrifices to their dark lords within the forest. The rider is feared by locals for his unwavering morals and aggressive persecution of evil. His steed is renowned for her silver fur, grey wings, complete trust in her rider, and resolute manner in protecting him from danger. This griffin, known as Iron Wing Kazi, is feared by those who know her and her talons are as sharp as the most masterfully forged sword. She often operates independently, seeking out evildoers and slaying them with savage might even without her rider. The Hippogriff Where the griffin comes from traditional mythology, the hippogriff is a slightly more modern creature. Its origins date back to the Renaissance poet Ludovico Ariosto, whose epic poem Orlando Furioso, published in 1516, featured a creature called a hippogriff that was halfway between a horse and a griffin. In Pathfinder, the hippogriff bears the wings, forelegs, and head of a great raptor bird, and the tail and body of a magnificent horse. 
It lacks hooves, however, featuring taloned claws instead. As horses are preferred meals for griffins, sages claim some flesh-warping wizard with an ironic sense of humor long ago created this fusion of horse and hawk as a joke, the ideal snack for a griffin. Indeed, because of their horse-like nature and smaller size, hippogriffs are frequently hunted and eaten by griffins in the wild, who view them as a particularly tasty winged horse. A hippogriff's feathers bear coloration similar to those of a hawk or an eagle. However, some breeders have managed to produce specimens with stark white or coal black feathers as well. A hippogriff's torso and hind end are most often bay, chestnut, or gray, with some coats bearing pinto or even palomino coloration. Hippogriffs measure 11 feet long and weigh upwards of 1,500 pounds. Unlike chimera and griffins, hippogriffs have animal-like intelligence. Because of their more animal-like intelligence, they are more easily domesticated by humanoids, and even more so than griffins, frequently can be found in larger humanoid cities where they are bred to serve as mounts. In the wild, hippogriffs are territorial and fiercely protect the land under their domain. Hippogriffs must also watch the skies for other predators, as they are the preferred meals of griffins, wyverns, and young dragons. Hippogriffs nest in sweeping grasslands, rugged hills, and flowing prairies. Exceptionally hardy hippogriffs make their home nestled in niches on canyon walls, from which they comb the rocky deserts for coyotes, deer, and the occasional humanoid. Hippogriffs prefer mammalian prey, especially rabbits and foxes, yet they are omnivorous and typically graze on grass after every meal of flesh to aid in their digestion. Their dietary habits can be dangerous to both ranchers and their livestock, so ranching communities often set bounties on them. Victims of these hunts are often taxidermied, and preserved hippogriffs frequently decorate frontier taverns and remote outposts. Far easier to train than griffins, yet easily as intelligent as horses, hippogriffs are trained as mounts by some elite companies of mounted soldiers patrolling the skies and swooping down on unsuspecting enemies. A hippogriff's saddle must be specially crafted so as not to impact the movement of the creature's wings. Like griffins, hippogriffs lay eggs rather than birthing live young, though as a general rule, a hippogriff nest only contains one egg at a time. Hippogriffs can be found in many parts of the world where griffins can be found. In the city of Corvosa, the Sable Company is a prestigious group of aerial marines. They are renowned for their use of hippogriffs as mounts. At times, the Sable Company takes preemptive actions against the city's potential adversaries. They are known for deploying spies strategically placed throughout the region to monitor potential threats, including pirates, smugglers, and Shawanti raiders. The previous leader of the Sable Company was Marcus Thalassinus Endrin, who met his demise in 4708 while attempting to assassinate Queen Iliosa Arabasti. Since Queen Cressida replaced her as monarch, the Sable Company has been reinstated, but it's not known who the new company commander is. The Sable Company are not the only people in Verissia to have domesticated hippogriffs. The Shawanti Hawk Clan, or the Shikiri Kwa, not only have domesticated hippogriffs to serve as mounts for their rangers and hunters, but have also taken the hippogriff as one of their totemic spirits, a totem that signifies travel, the wilds, and speed. In the less civilized realm of the River Kingdoms, wild hippogriffs are a very common concern for hunters and ranchers, especially in the kingdom of Artum. Otoniel Marks, the commander of Fort Tenve in Artum, oversees the protection of the local herds of cattle and offers a fine reward for any adventures that bring him hippogriff heads. As described in my Geb history video, after their glorious victory over the Whispering Tyrant, a group of knights of Last Wall attempted to infiltrate and exorcise the Ghost King. This failed, and they were all killed and later resurrected. One thing I did not mention in that video is that this special unit attempted to infiltrate Gib by air, using hippogriffs to do so. Their leader, Gustari Fallenstag, has since been resurrected by the Ghost King as a Grave Knight, and she still rides the skeletal hippogriff that served her in life. In his divine domain in the city of Axis, the god Abadar, the lord of trade and commerce, has a celestial hippogriff in his service. Unlike most of his kin, Cobblehoof is a highly intelligent creature, and though he does not usually speak, he understands numerous languages. Trained in battle and willing to carry riders, Old Cobb usually appears in mithril barding. Perhaps because of Cobblehoof, clerics of Abadar are known to be able to summon celestial hippogriffs to serve them in battle. The Manticore the manticore was a legendary Persian creature similar to the Egyptian sphinx that proliferated in Western European medieval art as well. Manticores were fearsome winged predators that melded various monstrous features into one deadly form. The etymology of the name comes from an old Persian compound word, consisting of martia, meaning man, and kordan, meaning to eat, so the name literally meant man-eater. In the world of Pathfinder, and indeed in most fantasy representations, manticores possess the body of a lion, equivalent in size to a large horse, 
coupled with dragon-like wings and a long tail ending in a cluster of vicious spikes. A typical manticore is about 10 feet long and weighs about a thousand pounds. Their heads vary, with some having a lion's face, but other rarer examples sporting the snarling visage of a bearded human. Possibly a related species to the chimera, the exact origin of manticores remains shrouded in mystery, although magic is believed to have played a role in their creation. Although not particularly sacred to Lamashtu as chimeras are, manticores are held in reverence by both servants of the archdevil Barbatos and the demon lord Nurgle. These creatures are voracious meat-eaters, showing no preference between freshly killed prey or rotting carrion. Like other such carnivorous magical beasts, they will roam vast territories in search of sustenance. Manticores boast sharp senses and tracking skills. They are physically powerful, wielding rippling claws and fangs. Most distinctively, they can launch a volley of spikes from their tails by whipping them at their prey, with these spikes regenerating within a day. Manticores are not mere beasts. Like chimeras, they possess intellect, and unlike griffins and hippogriffs, they are quite capable of speech if they wish to communicate. While still not as intelligent as humans, they do engage in strategic thinking, and often strike deals or coerce evil humanoids into assisting or serving them, particularly for lair protection. These creatures establish these dwellings in elevated places like hilltops and cliffside caves. Manticores also exhibit a peculiar fertility, capable of interbreeding with lion-like creatures such as common lions, dire lions, lamias, sphinxes, and chimeras. Offspring typically belong to the mate species, but display manticore-like features. This is why it is not uncommon to find a chimera with a spiked manticore-like tail. Manticores have been sighted in various regions across Galarian, including the hold of Belksen, the Nesmian Plains in southern Nirmathus, the hills of Glenibon in the stolen lands of the River Kingdoms, the Takalak Hills of Motaku Isle, and central Bag Island in the Shackles, and the Gem Basket of Katapesh. They were also hunted once by the Sarkorian warriors of Old Sarkorus, but few manticores have been seen there since the world wound opened up. They are also fairly common in Verissia, where they inhabit the hinterlands of Magnamar, the Stony Mountains, and the Devil's Elbow. Within the Dark Moon Vale of Andoran, manticores are found in the Arthfell Forest, with the Green Fire Circle and Fang Watch keeping their numbers in check. Not far away from this, a formidable manticore named Grasgaug fiercely guards a grove in Dark Moon Wood, believed to be the protector of an ancient elven artifact. The Chelish city of Corentin is one of the few cities in the world that have actually domesticated manticores, in the way griffins are in some other cities. Two prides of manticores are known to reside in the Roiling Den. There they are raised by the human ranger and Chelish navy lieutenant Frazura and Tello to both serve as mounts and to safeguard the city. The Pegasus in Greek mythology, the Pegasus was a winged horse. He was sired by Poseidon in his role as a horse god and by the Gorgon Medusa. Greco-Roman poets wrote about the equine demigod's ascent to heaven after his birth and his obeisance to Zeus, who instructed him to bring lightning and thunder from Olympus. In Pathfinder, the Pegasus refers not to a specific creature, but to a magical species of winged horses. Though highly coveted as aerial steeds, Pegasi are untamed in their natural environment and reticent beings, not easily befriended. A typical pegasus stands at six feet in height at the shoulder, weighing 1,500 pounds and boasting an impressive 20-foot wingspan. While most pegasi are white, an occasional one hatches with the traditional horse colorings and markings. Surprisingly, they possess human-like intelligence, despite their animalistic appearance. This means they are more intelligent than all the previous beasts I have discussed thus far. However, unlike chimeras and manticores, but like griffins, they are unable to vocalize. They can perfectly well learn and understand humanoid languages, however, and generally greatly prefer the company of benevolent humanoids to malicious ones. The most effective approach to persuade a pegasus to become a mount is through diplomacy, offering favors and performing good deeds. Just as is the case with a hippogriff, riding a pegasus also necessitates an exotic saddle, or none at all, as a regular saddle strap obstruct the creature's wings. A pegasus can engage in combat while carrying a rider, and a trained pegasi with an experienced rider will display no fear in battle. Pegasi lay eggs, which hold a market value of 2,000 gold pieces each, while young pegasi are worth 3,000 gold pieces per head. However, due to their human-like intelligence, the sale of eggs and young pegasi is essentially considered a form of slavery, and is generally frowned upon or prohibited in good aligned societies. The origins of the Pegasus are not clear, but it's possible they were not originally native to the material plane. A number of Pegasi can be found natively on the islands of the Maelstrom, for example, where they serve as the mounts for the Valkyrie and the Einherjar, the post-mortal forms risen from the souls of the legendary warriors of various ancient warrior cultures. 
Many Pegasi are also associated with Ashava, the true spark, the Azata, imperial lord of dancers, moonlight, and lonely spirits. Finally, on the material world, herds of Pegasi can be found in the lofty mountaintop domains of the cloud giants, who have a special love for them and keep their herds safe in the most remote reaches of the world. The Phoenix. The Phoenix appears in the mythology of the Mediterranean as early as the 5th century BCE. Although elements differ among historical records of the time, most myths describe the phoenix as a firebird with resplendent colors and a noble bearing. Although chronicled by both Greek and Roman scholars, the phoenix was a creature in Egyptian, Persian, and Indian mythology as well, capable of long, graceful flights and perpetuating life through self-immolation. In Pathfinder, the phoenix appears as they do in myth, as a great bird wreathed in flames. Despite all sharing this general overall description, phoenixes do exhibit significant variation in appearance based on their geographical region. In arid plains and deserts, they resemble large hawks and eagles with hooked beaks and ruby eyes. In jungles and savannas, they have the features of tropical birds. Some arid lands near ancient forests house owl-like phoenixes, their plumage generally bright on the crest but darkening towards the shoulders. Others come in red and yellow, with rare colors like white, green, and blue also to be found. Most phoenixes are birds of prey, with a preference for meat and the thrill of the hunt. They typically feed on local wildlife such as grazing gazelles, antelopes, various species of deer, and aurochs. Like dragons, phoenixes are not only just intelligent, but actually more intelligent than most humanoids, with a natural aptitude for arcane spellcasting. Also, like dragons, phoenixes are among the few creatures who will roast their meals before consumption, showing a preference for cooked over raw meat. Phoenixes reach immense sizes, standing at 20 feet, boasting a 40-foot wingspan, and weighing around 5,000 pounds. Males and females are of similar size, but males display brighter feathers during courtship flights, and the female's song is often considered more melodic. Although a phoenix's song doesn't possess inherent mystical effects, it is captivating to listeners. Described as a blend of a songbird's melody and a raptor's shriek, a phoenix's cry is seen as a good omen for various individuals. They mate for life, coming together briefly during a mating period, when the female produces an egg the size of a small wine cask. Both parents alternatively incubate the egg for six months. When it hatches, a young phoenix the size of an eagle emerges, rapidly attaining human-like intelligence. While the phoenix's physical attributes are impressive, its legendary reputation primarily stems from its association with magic and fire. At will, a phoenix can envelop itself in a halo of scorching fire, with flames that burn the flesh of anyone who comes too close. This fiery shroud obscures everything but the basic shape of the creature and the light of its eyes. The sight of a flaming phoenix is mesmerizing to allies and foes alike, sometimes ending the battle before it begins. Healing magic from a phoenix is also connected to its flames, with stories of fire waves that heal wounds and leave unblemished skin, or warm radiance that dispels poison and disease. Yet the phoenix's most remarkable power is its self-resurrection ability, allowing it to return to life within seconds of its death once per year. Those who witness a phoenix rise describe its course initially turning brittle and blackened, like a charred log, before being reborn in a burst of flames, reducing its husk to ashes. If a phoenix is slain again before its legendary power is able to recuperate, then it truly dies, and its spirit moves on for judgment. Not surprisingly, as a creature associated with fire and healing, the phoenix is a sacred creature in the Saranite faith. Devotees cite passages in Saren Ray's holy text, The Birth of Light and Truth, which indicates that the first phoenixes were created when the Dawnflower employed her magic to awaken a group of rocks and bless them with her fire when they pledged their service to her. It also shouldn't be surprising that phoenixes are particularly common in Kadira, which has always been a center for the Saranite faith. Other famous phoenixes can be found all along the length of the Golden Road. In the expansive under-dunes of Assyrian, a powerful and ancient phoenix named the Fire Song has made its lair on the side of a towering sandstone cliff. This location lies behind a perpetual cascade of sand, known cryptically as the River of Time. Near the Ocularium, a renowned wizard college in the city of Manaket, Rahadum, a phoenix named Embriax resides somewhere near the Path of Salt, along the inner sea shores. He has been known to visit the university and assist researchers in making the surrounding desert lands more habitable. His contributions have been invaluable to the scholars of the Ocularium. Not all phoenixes are goodly creatures, though most started out that way. Among the most infamous of the evil phoenixes are Pyrilicia, also known as the Reign of Embers. Pyrilicia was considered one of the strongest and most benevolent phoenixes of Avistan in the early years of the Age of Lost Omens. She rose to prominence during the First Mendevian Crusade by leading the charge against a Marilith general and her legion of minions. 
However, during the Second Crusade, when an abyssal rift opened up near the Wardstone line, Pyrilicia threw her body into the yawning chasm, blocking the demon's escape. Pyrilicia's heroic act, however, caused the dark energy pouring from the rift to slay her. When she resurrected from her ashes, the abyssal flames bonded with her and corrupted her, instilling her body with dark negative energy, making Pyrilicia thereafter utterly consumed by evil. The Lamassu The Lamassu once again comes from Persian mythology. Lamassu was an Assyrian deity. Initially depicted as a goddess in Sumerian times when she was called Lama, the god later evolved into a male deity, Lamassu, and was later depicted in Assyrian times as a hybrid of human, bird, and either bull or lion, specifically having a human head, the body of a bull or lion, and bird wings. Lama, or Lamassu, was a protective guardian deity. Sumerians, Akkadians, and Assyrians would carry icons of this god for good luck, and representations of this god would also frequently be found decorating temples across the land in ancient Persia. Just as it is with the Pegasus in Pathfinder, the Lamassu reflects a species of magical beast and not an individual entity. The Lamassu possess an awe-inspiring physique of a massive lion, measuring ten feet in length and brimming with powerful muscles. Sprouting from its back are a pair of grand, majestic eagle wings. Its head often takes a human-like form, complete with regal features, eyes adorned with flecks of gold, and a vast, thick beard. It often wears jewelry befitting a king. Like the deity they are inspired by, the Lamassu are staunch champions of goodness. Although most of these winged sentinels prove wise and knowledgeable, who make enemies of evil creatures, many races also find Lamassus arrogant, dismissive, and patronizing, taking umbrage at their superior attitudes and affectations. Such reactions from shorter-lived mortals confuse and sometimes even insult these ancient beings. Lamassus who witness members of other races actively combating evil can be moved to reevaluate such humanoids and may address them as allies or equals. Should good aligned creatures prove their skill and overcome any differences of attitude they might have with one of these majestic beings, they will find a true and noble ally and an invaluable resource for those hoping to defeat evil. With best intentions, Lamassus cannot help but be quite parental towards those who join their cause, bringing many lifetimes of experience to any struggle, as they are exceptionally long-lived. This often makes them stern, but those who know Lamassus find them to be extremely caring about those they protect. A Lamassu eagerly lays down its own life to protect those in peril, if such a sacrifice might win the day. Lamassus make their home in the hot deserts, and like phoenixes and sphinxes are most often found along the Golden Road in the inner sea region. They often seek ancient ruins or other remote areas where they can study and be consulted with to bring to bear the great knowledge of the ancient evils of the world. Alamasu is rumored to dwell near Timal, the Pillar City, a location I discuss in more detail in my Northeast Avistan region deep dive. Beyond the inner sea, the Lamassu are particularly prominent in the continent of Kazmarin. Notable sites that are known to have Lamassus include the city of Ular Kel, the capital of Karaz in the Grass Sea of Kazmarin, the site of the only oasis in the steppes, and a vital trade nexus at the intersection of two major caravan roads. Lamassus are also known to dwell in the ruins of Ninshabur, a once great and powerful empire in Kazmarin, until it was decimated by the greatest of all the spawns of Rovagag, the Tarask. The Sphinx. Sphinxes come from various mythological traditions, but most prominently Greek and Egyptian mythology. In Greek mythology, the Sphinx was a unique monster who stood at a mountain pass or at the gates of Thebes and asked each passerby her riddle. If the travelers didn't get her riddle right, the Sphinx would devour them. The tragic Greek figure Oedipus famously answered correctly and the defeated Sphinx killed herself. The Egyptians had Sphinxes as well, but these were generally seen as male and were guardian figures. It was the Egyptians who sculpted Sphinxes around their tombs, pyramids, and holy sites. Sphinx-like creatures also existed in various forms in Southeast Asian mythology as well, though these have no known connections to the Greek and Egyptian sphinxes. Inspired by the real-world mythology, in Pathfinder sphinxes possess four different possible morphologies. Each of these is intelligent, possessing the bodies of lions, the wings of birds of prey, but the heads of different species. These four species have a unique form of symbiosis that requires their interaction for mating and propagation of their line. The two most common and intelligent sphinx breeds are the gynosphinxes and the androsphinxes, though these labels are considered to be rude and demeaning by the sphinxes themselves. Both can be easily distinguished from their lesser counterparts by their human-like heads, resembling those of female and male humans, respectively. Androsphinxes are the most powerful among the sphinx kind, and take their role seriously, seeing themselves as paragons of nobility devoted to upholding justice and truth. They are known for their gruff, curmudgeonly nature, 
openly expressing disdain for those they deem less capable or morally compromised. However, they generally provide warnings to intruders in their territories and may negotiate safe passage for travelers in exchange for valuable information. They have a particular fondness for philosophy, ethics, and intellectual debates. Gynosphinxes, slightly less powerful than their male counterparts, possess intellects that dwarf that of most human scholars, and even androsphinxes. They are considered beautiful even by human standards, with human-like heads atop slender leonine bodies. Gynosphinxes are particularly concerned with logic and inference, especially in puzzles and riddles. A territorial gynosphinx may allow visitors to survive a visit to her domain or barter her valuable information in exchange for insight into a specific enigma or subject of interest. Their obsession with puzzles often outweigh their utility or significance. The ram-headed cryosphinx, while not necessarily evil, is viewed with scorn or condescension by their human-headed counterparts due to their lesser intelligence albeit still comparable to a bright humanoid. Always male, cryosphinxes obsessively accumulate wealth, relinquishing their treasure only when it might pose a new puzzle that might be used to seduce a gynosphinx and allow for mating. During conversation, cryosphinxes prefer worldly matters or to bask in fawning praise. The hyracosphinx, by contrast, with its falcon-headed appearance, is universally despised by other sphinx breeds. These exclusively male sphinxes possess territorial urges similar to their kindreds, but lack their mitigating qualities. They actively seek revenge on other sphinx types, savaging anyone who crosses their paths without much desire for conversation. Sphinxes of all breeds are known in legends and stories as guardians of great treasures, secrets, and sacred places. While there is truth to these claims, each breed guards these things for their own reasons, including altruism, greed, entertainment, or fear of a more powerful master. Consequently, many places concealing treasures or secrets that lack actual Sphinx guardians incorporate Sphinx imagery into their decorations. For those who have amassed great wealth, keeping a Sphinx on guard duty can be costly in treasure or inventiveness, as a bored Sphinx can become dangerous. Despite their relative rarity, especially outside their preferred deserts and arid hills, most people who encounter Sphinxes know the basics of how to behave around them, polite, pleasant, and observant. In the wild, sphinxes typically make their lairs in warm, dry caves or intact rooms within ruins. They tend to stay near the outside, especially cliffs and open spaces that allow them room to fly. As sphinxes age, they become more sedentary, to the point where the oldest sphinxes barely move, giving rise to legends that suggest some ancient statues of sphinxes may have truly calcified through magical means. Sphinx layers are often cluttered, reflecting their obsessions. Gynosphinxes and androsphinxes may have layers filled with books, papers, and academic materials, while cryosphinxes hoard anything of value, and hyracosphinx layers are filled with bones and trophies. Sphinxes have mixed relationships with visitors, including those of their own kind. Their territorial nature makes them solitary by default, but their need to satisfy their obsession for wealth, information, and entertainment makes them less likely to attack visitors outright. Instead, visitors may find themselves questioned for knowledge or valuable items they possess. If visitors lack anything of interest, a disappointed sphinx may resort to violence. Offering gifts or intriguing information can often override their territorial instincts, ensuring the visitor's safety. Sphinxes, much like cats, can quickly lose interest or become irritable, and those who bore or offend them may face dire consequences. Sphinxes rarely coexist with other monsters, or tribes of monstrous humanoids, unless there is something particularly fascinating about the group, or they are tied to a location or treasure the Sphinx guards. Even in these cases, the other creatures tend to give the Sphinx its space, avoiding its territory unless absolutely necessary. When two Sphinxes cross paths, their interaction is generally polite but tense. Both sides seek to gain new and useful information while engaging in intellectual one-upmanship. Brief alliances may arise, especially when mating is involved, but Sphinx's solitary natures often lead them to drifting apart. More commonly, if two Sphinxes wish to collaborate, it's through magical correspondence or messages carried by lesser creatures in exchange for knowledge from the Sphinxes. While the love of riddles and puzzles primarily applies to gyno Sphinxes, all civilized Sphinxes tend to be polymaths, knowledgeable in various subjects without becoming masters of any. Their intense but shifting focus may lead them to obsess over a single problem or issue for extended periods before abruptly moving on to a new interest. This intellectual leapfrogging results in sphinxes becoming repositories of rare and valuable trivia, despite their knowledge rarely being related or organized systematically. The ancestral home of sphinxes on Galarian is Osirian, where they have resided in the deserts there long before the rise of the ancient kingdom. Osirians have embraced the sphinx as a symbol of their cultural identity, with Sphinx statues adorning various locations, particularly flanking the entrances to important civic buildings. 
Sphinxes are regarded as symbols of guardianship and inscrutability, and the phrase silent as a sphinx describes someone who is not only quiet, but also observant and potentially dangerous. Sphinxes, in turn, value Assyrian culture for its emphasis on long-term planning, intellectualism, and its vast reservoir of knowledge and ancient secrets. However, most sphinxes find the actual presence of human communities in their midst distracting or stifling. Rumors suggest that the ruby prince employs several sphinxes as scholars and guardians of his most important and secret knowledge, a practice reminiscent of the days of the ancient pharaohs when such arrangements were common. Many long-forgotten tombs and libraries, believed to be buried in the sands from ages past, still await discovery, with ancient sphinx guardians presently awaiting scholar adventurers worthy of relieving them of their burdens. Beyond Osirian, sphinxes are most commonly found in the northern Gurundi deserts of Rahadum and Thuvia. It is rumored that the ancient islands of Iblidos, a region as old as Osirian, had a significant level of interaction with these magical creatures. Scholars and sphinxes from Iblidos often collaborated as colleagues, participating in public debates and lessons. Some of the peculiar sphinx statues around the inner sea are believed to have originated from this culture. While much of Avistan is considered too cold and heavily populated for the average Sphinx, their passionate pursuit of obsessions can lead them beyond their chosen territories, making them prevalent in out-of-the-way locations where ancient secrets and forgotten tombs await discovery. Mm -hmm.